The following interview was conducted with Catherine po uh, S. Cassie Potter, library retiree and the first library development officer for the Purdue Libraries. For the Purdue Do University Oral History Program, it took place on um, Tuesday, November the 19th, 2010, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome, Kathy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little about where you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born in Des Moines, Iowa, in, um, and I presume you want to know when. <laughs> I, was, I was born uh, on March 19th in 1935, uh -huh. and um, uh, my parents uh, both came from a small town called Callerton, Iowa, uh, and uh, mother was a homemaker. Dad uh, was a... Um, he was an engineer. He was not a trained engineer, but um, he for the telephone company. But um, had a a classic um, South Side Des Moines. That was not necessarily the best side of town, but we were really uh, we were really comfortable as far as we knew. We didn't know any different, right. and uh, spent quite a bit of time on my mother's family farm outside of Callerton and that uh, had a big influence on me and uh, was very important to me much more sentimental about that really than about you know my own home uh, which still exists but uh, the family farm is gone uh, completely no evidence of it at all so that's really sad except uh, a wonderful uh, 95 year old aunt who is still living who I go see a couple of times a year Wonder. Uh, who was uh, yeah married to my my mother's brother uh, and was the last people who farmed the farm uh -huh. um, have younger brothers who are twins and an older sister and I do go back you know to Iowa a couple times a year that's important to me um, just, I would say, somebody said to me one time uh, when I was talking about some things we did on the farm, you know, uh, they said, you, you had an idyllic childhood. And I said, uh, gosh, I guess I did. I never certainly thought about it. And as far as, you know, we didn't, money was not a factor in that. It was all about the environment and the love and so forth. And so, the things that were involved with the farm. Right, the farm and just the things I learned there and the safe, comfortable place that it was mm -hmm. and how we played, you know, very freely, you know, in the woods and pick berries and help with canning and all that sort of thing. So, uh, and later on when I was um, at the work as a fundraiser for the veterinary school, that farm background was definitely helpful to me. Tell us a little about grade school and high school. Well, grade school, um, I was always a good student um, and uh, have, you know, positive memories of school. Probably some of my most prominent memories have to do with uh, um, the um, World War II, being an elementary school student in World War II and the the Victory Gardens and the bringing money for the the war stamps and um, learning the, all the songs of the different um, armed forces and it was yeah. just a, it was a, that's kind of when I look back on it that's a big part of my elementary school memories sure and um, high school um, again this high school on the south side of town which was um, sort of, I guess you would say, on the wrong side of the tracks. I mean, it was not the, the Ritzy High School. It was a really a good education. I had some wonderful teachers. And uh, there, um, the, uh, well, I'm not sure what I was going to say, but I, um, one of the activities that I was involved in was uh, I was on the library staff. And that became very important to me because um, the librarian, the school librarian, was a huge positive influence on me. I wanted to be on the library staff. You know, my friends were on it, but also 
um, I love to read, and that's sort of a, my whole life. And um, she was so nurturing and, and helpful and so interested, and uh, nobody in my family had gone to college and never even considered going to college and didn't see any evidence that that would be possible. My friends were going to college, and then of course I was, I was actually taking a college prep course. I'm not sure why, but I was. And when uh, Miss Holt, Helen Holt, found out about that, she was just uh, shocked, and she just insisted that uh, I was going to go to college. <laughs> and so she really uh, encouraged me and helped me and wrote uh, scholarship recommendations and so forth. Good. And so I was able to stay in touch with her throughout my life, sometimes less than other times, but uh, uh, she's really uh, a primary person in my life. Right. And yeah. um, How large was the high school? Um, well, it was fairly large. I actually was in a small class, though, because when I was in school, the um, it was a city school, of course. Sure. Um, I... Um, when I was in school, they had classes that started in January and classes that started in September. And I was someone who had started in January. And so I only had actually 39 in my, in my high school graduating class. And I think there was only one more January graduation after our class, and they stopped doing that. Um, the schools in Des Moines were pretty advanced, and every, every high school had a swimming pool. And one of the requirements for graduation was that you had to be able to show that you could swim. Uh, yeah, it, it, it just all of it. I mean, I had out, outstanding teachers. And so, um, yeah, it definitely, um, I was very fortunate. I really appreciate the fact that I had that uh, good training. When I went to, to right. college, I was really Ready pretty well it. prepared. Right. Yeah, pretty and you well went prepared. To, you selected Iowa State. I went to Iowa State yeah. University. At that time, it was Iowa State College. And I kind of wanted to go to Grinnell, which was a liberal arts school, which maybe sort of fit me better. Uh, but That's a private school, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And I found that I could go to Iowa State without a scholarship for less than I could go to Grinnell with a scholarship. <laughs> And again, I you know, there wasn't any evidence to me that there was any family money, so I, I did put myself through school and um, took advantage of scholarships, worked. worked. Um, my main jobs were at the dorm where I set tables for quite a while. In those days, there were white tablecloths uh, for two meals a day and waiters. And, sure. you, had to ha that. and you had to have, um, you know, exhibit good manners and you were taught and be manners. dressed for dinner yes yeah mm -hmm. and then um so there were people who set all those tables and that was one of the things that i did um also worked in the kitchen making salads and setting up for breakfast you know was this the dorm that you were living in or this was the dorm that i was living oh, that in made it easy. yeah it, nice. it was very nice and um yeah, it was. I was very, very fortunate because that gave me my uh, my board, and my tuition was scholarship. And then I, so I think I paid um, seventy five dollars a year um, for the room part of it, and then of course I had my books and so forth. Sure. So, right. yeah. Well, it's people. It's too bad young people can't uh, do something like that now, but they can. So, yeah, I know. what was your major? I actually majored really in those days, especially at a land grant university. Um, most everybody uh, majored in home economics. I majored in textiles and clothing. There were a few women who majored in science, and a handful who majored in engineering. Of the women that I knew. But pretty much all the women were in home economics. They, have, they had liberal arts there too, as well. Here, well, it, what I think is, I had a liberal arts education because it, um, I was required to take speech and, sure, and all okay. kinds of literature right, and history, okay. and I was required to take physics and chemistry. And uh, right. so, uh, I 
chemistries. Required to take organic chemistry and inorganic chemistries. It was I considered it a liberal education. Sure. I really used it. I've used it all of my Sounds life. Like a good background. Yeah, it was a very good background and uh, had quite a few, you know, opportunities because I was in school there. Right. What uh, transpired after after graduation before you came to Purdue? Before I came to yeah. Purdue, um, my first uh, position. Uh, out of college was um, at Ayers in Indianapolis, the former Ayers, <laughs> the Ayers that uh, at people who have been around a while remember where it was uh, Mr. Ayers was actually the president, a young Mr. Ayers, who was not that young. Uh, but it was a wonderful place to work. I went into their training program and really it was so you came a from great Iowa begin. to work here right well they they went out to Iowa State and interviewed and um, yeah it was it was a great experience and um, after I had been in the training program for a while um, I I had been offered uh, an assistant buyers position and decided that really wasn't the side of the of the business that I wanted to be on and so I was actually then, maybe not too long after that, offered a new position, which was the youth coordinator. And it was a public relations kind of position. And um, so I did that. Uh, I started that um, program and enjoyed it a lot. Um, it was when... Uh, retailers were just beginning to realize that teenagers controlled money, even if they didn't have that much, but they control it. So uh, they had a um, charm school program that I created and taught, and uh, it was... Uh, Sounds like a good program. Nice. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a nice beginning sure. for a career. Then I um, married, and my former husband was in... Um, graduate school at Ohio State. So I went to Did you last meet him in Indianapolis? No, I met him in at Iowa State. Oh, okay. And so I went to uh, Lazarus in Columbus, Ohio, and did basically the same kind of a job there. They started a program like what we'd had at Ayers, and I got that started and taught that class. And there were a lot of other... Uh, public relations type assets. I also worked somewhat in fashion show production there. That was kind of oh, good. a side thing. Well, um, I was really kind of ready to leave that uh, and I was planning to go to graduate school at Ohio State and I became pregnant, which was fine with me. So then I uh, had a, I was a stay-at-home mom for 19 years. Okay. Uh, and uh, really was uh, perfectly happy to do that. I had was very active in the community, the local community here, because when well, Ali came to Purdue, did you come to Purdue because your husband? Took yes. The position? Okay. Yes, and um, that was, uh, I believe, um, in '61 uh, or so. Okay. And. Uh, Where'd you live when you first came here? Oh, we lived in the um, the houses that were back on the golf course. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? about? They them. were on the circle where the fraternities and sororities are sure, now. Sure, I heard. And about they them. were little national homes okay. uh, that had been built after World War II because of the influx of students. They had to have professors, and they so, had to have housing. Yeah, and right. they had to have housing. Right. So, so they were they were in the woods on the golf course and. Uh, the only disadvantage is after we moved in, and they were going to be like ninety or ninety-five dollars a month rent. <laughs> you can imagine. Uh, we were excited because we thought we could really save money for a house down payment. We'd already saved some, and um, but they were their two bedroom. The one, the one that we had, we painted the whole thing, including the inside of the closets. Um, Worked very hard on the floors, et cetera, and that would have been about November. We moved in in August. Um, we got word that we would have to move out the next spring. We were supposed to be able to be there for two years, and uh, they were 
they they had decided to create this new the the uh, sorority and fraternity I don't know what that's called back there the acres the acres and um, it was okay I mean people started moving and that was okay because we had a baby we didn't you know have little children that might be need playmates but then they started moving the houses and that was kind of grim and they they um, would do things they were like bringing in dirt in dump trucks and stuff and one day I was at home and they they had dumped their dirt and they had left the truck bed up and it snapped the electricity uh, wires and uh, I said let's let's start looking <laughs> we had thought we would stay as long as we could because we were saving money so then we found the home that I'm still in which is very near campus sure. and uh, that was turned out to be a wonderful stable neighborhood and a great place to raise a family and, right. and close to schools and everything yeah else. And, yeah and very I'm very happy there still so that's good okay well now let's talk about the first position you had was over in the vet school is that when you, you came to Purdue to start after you were here and then you started working yes at Purdue? well my my first position oh. in the community was at the Sycamore Girl Scout Council oh, okay. I did PR and fundraising for them okay and I had done um, my main volunteer work in the community was with the League of Women Voters up until that time and I had done some projects with them and they accepted my volunteer credentials which probably you know that was a great thing for me uh, because in those days um, uh, positions for which you were not paid really didn't count you know <laughs> and uh, so it was uh, that was a real advantage for me gave me an opportunity to have some interaction with some business people in town who wrote reference letters for me and that kind of thing and so um, I I started out uh, it was a halftime position I was the yes, school of veterinary oh, at the school school, okay. school of veterinary medicine uh, and um, I in about um, I don't know less than six months it became full-time okay. so it was definitely was that, were good, you the first one there? They had not. I was it? the first one. They did not have anyone. Many of the schools did not have right. fundraisers, and so I was kind of uh, the new wave, and uh, that's the kind of thing that I really respond to and thrive on. Same thing with the Girl Scouts. They didn't have anyone as a fundraiser. I mean, the girls, of course, sold cookies, but so I really started their fundraising program too, uh, and. That um, this is something that I thrive on. So, uh, and uh, the vet school was uh, there. My farm experience in having graduated from a land grant university. I mean, I completely understood what Purdue was all about. That was a big help for me. I really enjoyed uh, the veterinarians. Uh, was Stockton the dean at that time? Dean Stockton. And then Ann Kirker was there at that time. Yes, too. the she was the librarian. Yeah, right. I, you know, I'm not sure whether she was there. Gretchen might have been there. I did know Ann Kirker, but I think she might have. She just may retired. have been retired by then. That yeah. Could be, yeah. Yeah. Could be, right. Yeah, and um, great, great experience. Uh, but and I don't know how much you know you want to know about that. Um, they had a campaign, uh, and that was kind of why they were hiring someone. Uh, they had, and those are in the early days of really development and everything. What's now advancement? It's all different. Really changed when Jeske came. Well, things were very different there. I mean, very different then. Um, there was not there was not much of any sort of a central office. Uh, there was one, but not that much. There had been uh, a campaign. I think it would have been during Hansen's time, but I well, know. Bering had a vision. Had Vision Twenty One. Well, and yeah, and really, uh, Bering's. That was when I think the real beginning of um, development at Purdue, and he and I were at the same new 
employees lunch. You know, when you're first hired, there's a big lunch. Well, he was a new hiree at the same time I was. Okay. And, and 83 is when he came. Yes, 83. Uh, I came in August of 83. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was kind of fun. We were the new kids on the block, but there was some differences there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was nice to get well it, it's just, I, I, I think sometimes there, uh, he might get a little short shrift because uh, of the great advances in fundraising after he left, but there, there were some pretty amazing things, and he also did so much to improve the appearance of campus, which was... And the Perfectly bell okay before, but it just blossomed. Especially the bell tower. That's just awesome. Well, the bell tower, but I'm just talking about, uh, don't you remember the um, area in front of Hovde Hall was just big green with some people paths that people had made by walking? I mean, and, and everybody was so... That was supposed to be such a big deal, and it's just wonderful they put now. All, and they had the, the lovely plantings in the median along mm -hmm. Northwestern, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was really nice. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the landscaping and area really changed a lot mm -hmm. during this time. Well, actually, there was Loeb Fountain was in front of oh, Hubdi, yeah, right. and then that got moved, right. uh, which some people were opposed to, but, uh, you know, but progress. Worked progress. Out. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about, let's move to the library then. How did... Uh, how you came from the vet school here. Yes, Talk a about I, uh, you know, I think I had been at the vet school seven, maybe eight years, and I, I think I was maybe getting a little bit restless, and uh, uh, I think there's a certain amount of burnout that happens when you're in the same position for a long time, and I, uh, uh, during the time I was at vet school, I had become a certified fundraising executive and that um, I don't know I felt like I wanted maybe a new challenge I'm mm -hmm. sure I could have gotten a new challenge there and Hugh Lewis who was the Dean was really wonderful to me when I said I was interested in looking at this at the sure. library's position um, I have to re I remember that there had been an article I think in the alumnus and, and Emily Mobley was on the front page or front cover oh, right. and I read that article and I thought gosh this person really sounds amazing <laughs> I can remember asking uh, Hugh Lewis Dean Lewis uh, is, is she really is that article really what she's like he said yeah I really think it is <laughs> I so, remember that issue. Yeah, it was a really <laughs> nice, I might even still have that somewhere, I'm not sure, but um, uh, I, um, I applied and um, was fortunate enough to be selected, and uh, really uh, it, uh, it was an opportunity, again, to start a new program. And, of course, benefiting from what I had learned from my previous experiences. Right, yeah. Yes, right. yeah. Well, what are some of the things, you know, you had, one of the things I was going to ask about uh, establishing your donor base, and you had a kitchen cabinet, too. You know? Right. Um, that was part of the challenge that I appreciated. A, a bonus that I hadn't thought about was that now, instead of my constituents being one school, my constituents were the whole university, in theory. Of course, there were some other, you know, school people were not wanting uh, the library is necessarily to to uh, consider their alums' prospects, but um, that was a very slowly evolving process. Um, the libraries, fortunately, did have a few, you know, lar had had a few larger gifts, um, and they had a real advantage in that the class of '35 had chosen the libraries as their class gift. Um, the object of their class gift. So there were people in that class um, who, uh, who had been initiated into the idea of the libraries. But I sort of operated from the point of view that maybe we don't have any graduates, but everybody yes. in, the, in the university is our constituent. Everybody, you know, needed the library. And <clears throat> 
And I think it's really evolved until today. Judy could tell you better than I. It wasn't quite there when I left. But uh, it takes quite a bit of time on that. Oh, it, all of that takes sure. time. Right. And well, didn't that it help too? The dean only had this advisory committee. Well, yes, and and I was I wrote some things down because I wanted to talk a little bit about how we how we Good. started out. Um, we did have some donors that already existed. Um, I, well, this was for one. Well, right, but actually, we sort of uh, what what I really started out to do was to to build an organized uh, program with different aspects of it and and um, and to build the donor base and to try to build access to other potential donors. And so um, uh, one of the things that I recommended and that we did do fairly soon was to create um, our uh, uh, development advisory board. and. And some of the people that were on that board from the very beginning were uh, people who became our uh, more generous donors. And on that board was, uh, were uh, uh, Wayne Booker, who eventually he made a number of different gifts over the years, large gifts, and in the end endowed a chair. Um, it was interesting. Um, I just found him. I mean, I got a report of gifts that we had received, and you know, I think maybe that he had been giving like five hundred dollars or four hundred or something, which was a big gift. And um, so made contact with him, um, talked to him, you know, told him who I was, asked him, told him we were at the beginning, and and I was just wondering if he'd be willing to share why he made this gift to the library. You know, we appreciated it and it meant it would help us to know why he gave it. And he said, and this is a wonderful story, that, and this is a man who was vice president of Ford Motor Company at that time. And um, he said that he, when he was in school at Purdue, he was married, and they had almost no money. They had virtually no money. So instead of buying books, he would go to the library and use the books at the library or check the books out if he was able to. But that was one of the ways he got through school was using the resources that were available in the library, much more so than the average student sure, would right. have done. But uh, one of the things about development that people don't understand who are just saying, oh, you're a fundraiser, you know, I'll keep my hands in my pocket or something like that, um, is that it is all about relationships. And um, it's communication and relationships. And um, you need to know what your story is. And that was another thing we did. We created a case statement for the libraries, who we are, why we're important, what it, what it is we need. You know, why we when need you're it talking to you. people, you have to have a plan. What, what well, are you planning to do with it, if indeed? Share exactly, with it. especially when it's a big gift. Uh, Get your ducks lined up. Well, absolutely. Why would anybody want to just, you know, hand out Do you need bills? $10? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, um, so developing a case statement was one of the first things we did, and then identifying some of the people who had already given us some money and beginning to work with them. And get to know them. Um, we did uh, create this development advisory board, which was helpful to us. Um, another person who was in that group was Tom Wilmoth, who was another one of our very generous donors. Um, uh, and anyway, I went down to Texas to visit him, took him a proposal we made after we had our case statement. Um, I mean, he visited many times. Uh, he came to most of the advisory committee meetings. Uh, Emily visited him. Um, we, um, in several million dollars, certainly, uh, and also for Well, he Booker. got the pinnacle from Dr. Jeske. He got one of those pinnacle awards, I think. Yes, yeah, and um, yes, and that was, that was after I That's retired. Right, exactly. That's right, exactly, Yeah, and then um, another uh, name that I wrote down was um, 
the Alexander, who, they were one of the early donors. They had been from the class of 35. Tom Wilmoth was from the class of 35. Wayne Booker was younger than that. But, um, and the Alexanders, um, that was one of our early gifts. I believe it was around $25,000, but it was uh, to equip the um, instruction room down in the undergraduate library, in the Hicks Undergraduate Library. And um, uh, so many of our um, gifts, even gifts now that have come since I left, have uh, in, been initiated. Uh, the, the first contact was really that class of 35 gift. Um, the, um, they set up the library scholars as well. Yeah, that, well, that was actually what their gift was for. That's right. Uh, so these are a, a supplement additional yeah. to the individuals yeah. themselves. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I understand. Um, and then um, I wanted to talk about Fred Villerbeck a little bit, um, and mostly because he was somebody who was already giving. He was giving gifts in kind. He was a uh, an avid um, collector of fine books, and he then passed those books on. I think he had enjoyed acquiring them, and uh, he then passed them on uh, to special collections here, and he got a great deal of pleasure from that. Uh, and um, it was, it's been a significant collection. He was one of the, the early people that we identified, and he right. was also on that first development advisory board. John Hicks was also on that first advisory board, the person for whom the Hicks Center Graduate Library is named, I'm sure uh, I, that doesn't need to be explained, but um, he, there are a couple of things about him, he and his wife, uh, Swifty. Uh, early on, one of, a really fun thing was his children called and wanted for Christmas to give their parents they wanted to surprise them by making gifts to the undergraduate library. So uh, we were able to cook something up and made special um, book plates that could go into the books that were purchased from that collection. Uh, this again is all about communication and relationships. Uh, but at the same time um, that that was going on, and it went on for quite a number of years, I don't know if they still do that or not, but um, John himself, uh, who was on our Development Advisory Committee, he's kind of a famous, <laughs> um, a legendary character at Purdue. And so he just did so much to help create goodwill. And uh, many of our annual solicitations, and that was another thing that is basic part of beginning a program, is to at least ask once a year if people would give. And the libraries hadn't really even been doing that. So um, uh, John, for a number of years, um, that letter went out over his signature. And uh, talking about John was frequently the beginning of a conversation that you would have with somebody. Another person who was on that first development advisory committee, thanks to John, and I can't think of this young man's name, but he had been is that Dave Parker? Would that be Dave Parker? No, it wasn't Dave Parker. Dave Parker was on it. It was a. Uh, it was Dave. Was it Dave Parker? But uh, the student who had um, who had been involved with the with raising uh, raising money for the the uh, undergraduate library. Right. Yeah, right. actually, it was Dave Parker, okay. and I'm embarrassed that I didn't remember okay. that. Actually, I I have to tell you, I had to sit and think up these names. I, I at first. They didn't come, and I thought, well, I'll call Judy and have her help me, but I was surprised eventually more of them came. And, of course, I am leaving out, you know, a oh, number of names. Right. I mean, okay. it's, uh, just, it's just it's what you're building, you're, we're getting a core of people, and we have the advisory committee, and then you had events, and they would meet, what, twice a year or something? Well, another thing we did that I think helped us a great deal, um, people, and this is one of the things I said when I was interviewed, People 
don't hear about the libraries at all. If they hear anything about the libraries, I've been on campus for seven or eight years, it was something negative about them not having something or the hours not being good or whatever. Well, we needed to turn that around, <laughs> no question about it. And in the development area, uh, the libraries had not been represented at the President's Council annual weekend. Uh, this I'm sure somebody has talked to you about where um, alums come, or donors come back to campus Which and there are a series of classes um, offered to them and there's a football game and there's a dinner and a lunch and so forth. They're just a wonderful weekend and, and very much enjoyed by donors. And we had never uh, had any presence there at all, and in fact, had never had any presence at any of the social events. So that was something we changed really right away. And so we always had a class, and they were always well attended. Right. And we know that we made some right. uh, connections that way. Um, and then also, we tied that in uh, where the researchers that special collections would always have a display before yes. the next day before mm -hmm. the pregame, and that went on for a while, and that yeah. was really good. Like yeah. typically, the time we did Amelia, then we had Amelia things on display. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I think really a, a basic um, aspect of fundraising is being visible, and. Why, why would anybody even think of giving money to you if they don't even think about you? Right. Or and don't know they you don't know what you're doing. Right. And so, um, so that was, I think, important too. Um, I think, oh, another thing that happened um, that I think was positive and helpful, a small thing, was um, we worked with President Beering and his wife uh, they established a, a memorial program when a member of the President's Council um, died. Then they um, gave a book to the library and, and uh, there was a plate placed in the book and then a letter went out to uh, the uh, family yeah, indicating right, yeah. I remember that. and sending a copy of the plate and I hope that's still going on. I don't know if it is or I not. Don't think but so. Um, I don't know, are there things that you especially... I was going to ask, uh, make a comment on the uh, your kitchen cabinet because that was an intern. Oh, that was something that I yeah. meant too. Yeah. And actually, um, <laughs> the the kitchen cabinet was sort of, I just used that term because of Harry Truman and his sure, kitchen right. cabinet, but it was just the idea of having some people who were on the staff and faculty uh, who would advise me. <laughs> Uh, you know, the dean um, was a part of the development advisory council that, where we had our donors, but this was just sort of the daily work and getting advice from them, and then this group of people helped host the development advisory committee, helped present sure. uh, to the advisory committee, and, and um, that I started that pretty early on. and. and um, well, that gave you, you know, interaction with the uh, faculty and staff. Oh, it was very faculty. important. And it's they get gifts in kind, and those people may need be a prospective donor for, for financial yeah. contribution. And, and the thing about this is I, uh, a development person has to know their product. Okay. They, and there was a lot to learn about the libraries. Sure. All really uh, fascinating to me um, and very, um, very interesting people and really important uh, work and I was already a believer but I became much more of a believer <laughs> the more I knew the more sure. of a believer I was right um, a donor base how did that sort of expanded I mean you sort of yes it did it expand um, anytime anybody ever gave a gift and to the libraries then they according to the rules then for development they were considered our prospect too um, and so we could we could contact them in any way, and so it was a. I had a lot of help from people in um, the advancement research area right. because uh, I did things. Uh, one of the most interesting things I did is uh, one of the people um, created a database that the people who are already giving, 
and um, what class years they were from, what their majors were, um, just um, just so I could get a, a profile, an impersonal profile. I mean, I would have loved to have had a personal profile, but it, I mean, I didn't know these people so that you could look. And that's how I realized how, what a good process the people from the class of 35 were. Um, oh, I, you know, I didn't talk about Walter Vian. No, that would I, be good. Yeah, I, One before you do that, the yeah. class of 35, that was on your watch. They had not done anything before you came on? Yes, they had oh, done okay. before All because right. um, the scholars program, that was uh, David Moses worked okay. with them. Okay. And that was right before I came on, on. And I almost think maybe that was an encouragement to go ahead and hire somebody that, yeah. So that was, so, That's so they did do that. That's a good make because that, yeah. we have the scholars program. It's ongoing now, as you uh -huh. well know. Right. But the fact that it was sort of started or in process before you came it, on as development. It, it had happened. I mean, they had had their reunion, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure. Okay. And so uh, it might have been uh, the previous fall. Okay. And I came again in August of 83. Because I remember Dave was involved. So with Dave that. was involved with that, and then he and he continued to uh, right. be a part of the contacts. Right. Right. Uh, yes. And again, it's a people business. And if David hadn't done that, and he hadn't been the face of the libraries, then um, that gift would have never came come and then a lot of other gifts wouldn't have come I think a comment should also be made uh, the class of 33 uh, well which Ann Kirker was that and that's mm -hmm. where the mural was made uh, that was their gift and that's a mural that's outside the Hicks undergraduate library oh yes yes yeah. she was her class was instrumental and of course she was a very active member of that class. right right to the former she's right. deceased now but she was a bit yeah well that I, I I should finish this business yeah, about the the database and then I'll come back to to yeah, the beyonds right. um, uh, the um, thing that, it, that study was so revealing because um, you would expect the libraries largest constituent base would be from the School of Liberal, Liberal Arts or uh, the, at that time it was HSSE. Yeah, yeah, HSSE. Um, but it was the math and science and to some extent engineering but especially math and science. So it was like Renaissance people <laughs> who were, they were scientists but they were supporters of the sure. libraries. And um, I used that information from that study so many times okay. uh, when even talking with donors. Um, every, everyone has a stake in the libraries, no question about it. Um, Walter Vion, um, he and I think his wife's name was Sarah, but I think she went by Sally. Um, that was something that happened about the last year I was at the libraries maybe the last year and a half and um, I think he was from the class of 35 or 34 but he was definitely in that vintage um, he we were connected with him and again this is relationships when you're a libraries development officer you need to have good relationships with the development people in the schools and um, and the people in the central office and Gordon Chavers, the university development attorney, uh, called me up and said, you know, if somebody would give the libraries a million dollars, what would you do with it? And I said, I'll talk to Emily and I'll get right back to you. <laughs> and um, and so that was the beginning of that relationship, which was just a delight, just a wonderful couple. But especially, she did die before. The project that we did um, actually evolved, but um, he, I just his story is just really embedded in my mind because <clears throat> he told me when he came during the depression, um, he just had nothing, and he was desperate for a job, and there were no jobs, and he said he went to the union and uh, talked to the food service people. And the woman who was director of that, I couldn't tell your name, but evidently was kind of an, a legend also, 
But uh, she said, uh, you know, Vion, you're not going to get a job. The jobs are going to go to the people who are seniors and juniors. You know, we're not giving any jobs to freshmen. We, we've got to help these people get through. And so he asked her to put his name on the list. And um, so uh, Saturday game day came, and all of her workers wanted to go to the game. So she called him up and said, Vion, if you can get over here, I'm going to give you a job. So he went over and he took, she took him into the ballroom and showed him these tables and tables full of dirty dishes. People had had a lunch and then left. She says, I want to get this cleaned up, you know, and here's, here are the trays and here's the room where you put them. Well, he told me that um, he put the dishes on the tray and then he, he took one tablecloth and he would pile several trays on the tablecloth and he would pull it back to this room where he was supposed to put the dirty dishes. And she came back in an hour and a half or so to check on him and he was completely done. She said, Vion, you've got a job. <laughs> so uh, it, it's just wonderful to talk to him. That was just such an yeah, advantage right. of he this position. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then he was also the one, and I think this is in the archives now, and he brought me a copy of the letter that he got from uh, Dean Potter, the Dean of Engineering, uh, when he, if you got all A's, I guess it was, um, you didn't have to pay tuition the next semester. And, um, and maybe this was Tom Wilma, I'm not sure, but regardless, uh, if you got the A's, then the tuition was waived for the following semester. Yes, yes. and. Um, and whichever one of them that showed this to me, the letter, and I did give a copy of it um, to the archives, the letter said, you know, it's great that you're getting good grades, but you should be sure to take some time to get involved in some of the things around campus so you can get the full value of having been at Purdue University. It was just such a touching letter. <laughs> it was from Dean Potter. Oh, okay. okay. So, do you have anything else on your notes on you um, think it's Oh, I actually, um, I don't know. Uh, in terms of libraries development, I think maybe um, that's the basis of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I think and so. And I think the other one big thing we did was, the, well, I think one of the biggest was the two mil that we had. The two mil celebration, you know, the access for the two mil and the two mil plus. I mean, that was a big event. Mm -hmm. That uh, we had a really good turnout for that. So, <clears throat> yeah. Are there other things? Um, I was going to ask you. The League of Women Voters. You're a longtime member. You're still. Yes, in I that. am, and I'm still involved. And um, I, I, uh, I became involved uh, about. I think 43 years ago, <laughs> and uh, I'm looking for 50 years. If you're 50 years, then you don't have to pay dues anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the national dues, you don't pay national dues anymore. But anyway, that that has made uh, was an important difference in my life, and I truly think uh, was very helpful to me in terms of uh, becoming the kind of thinker I am and enjoying people as much as I do, uh, but also the experience I had there fed right into what I ended up doing as a career because I did a lot of PR and I did some wrote grant proposals that were funded uh, for the league. One of them uh, was money from the Environmental Protection Agency for our local league. So um, that was kind of how I realized that I could be a fundraiser. Okay, so. sounds good. How about any awards did you do? Well, um, and, and professional associations. Well, the National Society of Fundraising Executives, I was um, Are you still a member of that. No, no, no. Oh. Uh, I, I was no longer a member. There was also a um, libraries development officers group uh, that I was involved with. It was very loose, but it was good with and it other was very libraries? helpful. Um, with other libraries? Yes, oh, okay. uh, other, other university libraries. Right. Okay. Okay. And also th there had been an organization like that at the vet school that mm -hmm. I was involved with. And then, as I think I mentioned, I do I, uh, the National Society of Fundraising Executives, and their name is a little different now. I'm not sure mm -hmm. exactly how they changed it. But 
they had a certification process that I went through when I was at the veterinary school, um, which was pretty challenging. And um, I decided that was something I wanted to do. I'm glad I did it. There was a test and a certain amount of experience and a certain amount of money raised. And it was interesting for me there. The the um, organization that administered the tests and so forth was the same one that administered the board certifications and so forth the vet school so they definitely were impressed <laughs> it was really a nice little side thing that yeah, I had to figure right. and um, in terms of other awards I you know I was elected to mortar board in, when I was in college um, mm -hmm. you know um, I don't I don't know that they're okay. uh, what about um, a favorite Purdue tradition um, Do you have one? It's it's funny. Um, one of them, I think, is associated with the veterinary school. Every fall, they have a veterinary conference that is very well attended, and that every Tuesday end of September. Uh huh. And right, and yeah. along with that, then they have every five years they have class reunions, and that just was really an enjoyable and fun thing for me. And then the other thing is, I didn't really discover it till after I retired. And that is the concerts that the band plays on the steps of Hubby Hall after a football game. I somehow missed that. I don't know why, but I did. And uh, I think that is really a wonderful tradition. It is, and it's still, still going on. Yeah. yeah, well, that's great. They should never stop it. That's <laughs> right. How about an outstanding event? Um, an outstanding event, uh, what? In your life? Or In anything? my life? Right. Um, I thought about that a little bit. I mean, I think every mother would say her, the birth of their children, but then I thought, uh, you want something else. And no, so, no. No, no, no. But I think um, it's kind of associated with, I mean, it's a family thing. Um, when, um, let's see, when would that have been? Uh, in the 70s early 70s we were on sabbatical in Seattle and the family uh, youngest was 18 months old or even maybe younger a four-year-old and an eight-year-old and my uh, then husband and I we went um, to Alaska and back we put up the car on um, the uh, the Alaskan ferry which was uh, the water highway and then we drove through Alaska and we camped out in a tent uh, for seven weeks. Uh, and it was a really uh, life-changing event for me in terms of my appreciation of the environment and also uh, getting along with a minimum amount. Because when you were in Alaska in those days, uh, you had a plan when you would buy your gasoline and you had to take extra tires with you and even a grocery store was really challenging to find a grocery store so and you had young children yeah yeah and it was so good for them it was good for all of us yeah. and uh sounded like a good trip it was a it was really i think it was an important event in my yeah. life i've had other really you know important events too but that i think that's nice yeah okay. how about retirement activities well I'm still active in the league. Mm -hmm. um, uh, try to resist, you know, getting too active. I'm active, much more active in my church than I was before, um, St. Andrew United Methodist Church. And um, I do travel. A lot of it is family travel. Um, friends are very important to me, and I get to spend more time and enjoy my friends. I belong to two book groups, which I had not had time to read. That was something I was be sure, you know, sure I was going to do, and I have done that. And also, I like to try new things um, and meet new people, and so I've been doing that. It's okay. just great. I recommend it highly. Talk about family, just to mention about the children. You have three children. Yes. Uh, the oldest one is uh, Amy Monahan. She has uh, she and her husband and two children live in uh, Phoenix or Chandler, Arizona, which is part of the Phoenix complex. 
she went to school at Earlham and has a master's degree from the um, uh, University of Washington at St. Louis, or Washington University is the right term, I guess. Mm -hmm. she, has, um, um, she and her husband, who also graduated from Earlham, um, are in real estate business together and still surviving even in this economy. Um, my oldest son is, um, lives in Carmel, Indiana, and has one daughter um, who is nine years old now. Uh, and um, my youngest son is uh, Jeffrey. I guess I didn't say my oldest son's name is Douglas. And my youngest son's name is Jeffrey. And he and his wife live in Madison, Wisconsin. He, um, he has, um, Douglas's degree is from Kalamazoo College, and he has an MBA from Butler. Jeffrey um, has a degree uh, in filmmaking from New York University in the Tisch School of the Arts, and um, a master's degree in um, South Asian Studies uh, from the University of Wisconsin. He spent a couple of years in the Peace Corps in Nepal, um, and uh, so that took him there. So he and his wife have um, a little girl who's almost three and um, a baby on the way. Oh, sounds good. Well, I think we're coming down. I'll leave this. Something I is there anything I forgot to ask or in summary or anything that you can think of? Um, I don't think so, um, but I guess something that's had the biggest impact on my life is that uh, college degree that I got. And I, um, I think it's just an evidence of um, someone um, who takes a little bit more interest in some, you know, in a, a young person, uh, what an impact that can have on your life, especially since um, I had a late in life divorce and, you know, needed to earn a living. And thank goodness I had that degree. Okay, good. Thank you, Kathy. This concludes it. Thank you very much. Well